I just want to welcome you all to our webinar series around the COVID-19 pandemic and how it's influencing um, our management of MS. And one of the uh, topics that has been put on the back burner, but it's beginning to emerge now because people have been to realize that the pandemic's not gonna go away necessarily in a few weeks or months, but it's probably gonna be with us for months or years, is the issue of uh, pregnancy and um, uh, family planning. So um, I'd welcome my colleague, Ruth Dobson, who's become the MS pregnancy expert in the UK. Ruth, I hope you're gonna talk about the register as well. Uh, so Ruth's running the pregnancy register. Um, uh, and over to you, Ruth. Okay, so thank you, Gavin. Um, so I've been asked to talk about MS and pregnancy in the COVID-19 era. Um, this is, as Gavin says, rapidly becoming a hot topic. Um, one of the problems with developing slides on this topic is that every time I look at the evidence, it changes. So every 24 hours, 48 hours, there is new information about um, pregnancy and COVID-19. So these slides are up to date as of this morning, but I suspect by tomorrow there'll be more information. So it's a topic that's really important to keep on top of. Okay, so those are my disclosures. So really the first question is, um, why does this matter? I think during the last nine weeks, the pandemic, everything has been put on hold. Fertility treatments have been put on hold. Pregnancy has not really been a pressing issue other than for women who are already already pregnant. But this is becoming increasingly an issue. Life can't go on hold forever. forever. Potential criticisms are that maybe this is too niche to have much clinical relevance. And I would answer that by saying, well, actually, there's a significant number of women with MS for whom family planning really is at the top of their mindset. Um, and it's really important to them, even if it's not important to you. The second criticism is that, well, these women have MS, they have preg they're pregnant, they, they should be stringently distancing. Actually, is any further discussion really needed? This, this is, you know, this is the advice. Why, why do we need to spend the next 40 minutes talking about this? And my answer to this would be around the fact that um, the social and psychological implications of stringent distancing for months and months on end um, when people are not able to or do not feel able to seek um, medical attention is is really significant and there's a, a huge amount of morbidity that's arising from that with regard to the ms sphere there is an argument um, put forward by some that personally i don't agree with that women who are with ms who are pregnant shouldn't be on dmt anyway and therefore advice from a neurologist should be superseded by advice from an obstetrician whereas i think we all know now as we move forward that that actually a joint care and joined up care is enough and the final criticism is that there isn't really enough evidence to guide recommendations well that's true for everything in covid but it doesn't mean that we should compromise our care so what i plan to to cover in this webinar. So general principles around COVID-19 and pregnancy. So are there issues around susceptibility to COVID-19 in the pregnant population? And do the pregnant women, are they at risk of more severe illness? Are there immunological questions around or immunological factors around pregnancy that, that may drive this? And what is known from existing pregnancy series? I'm gonna uh, illustrate some of these principles using a few case discussions and specific aspects that I want to cover are what to discuss prior to pregnancy, MS COVID-19 and antenatal care. So what are the implications of the pandemic for antenatal care specifically with women for women with MS? And finally, postpartum considerations, including relapses and breastfeeding. So firstly, COVID-19 and pregnancy. So there's now a number of large, relatively large case series. We've got approaching a thousand women um, in the largest systematic review who are who are pregnant and have had COVID symptomatic COVID-19. And actually the infection rate appears to be similar between pregnant and non-pregnant individuals. Um, around and around um, the clinical syndrome again seems to be similar between pregnant and non-pregnant individuals there doesn't appear to be a different clinical syndrome in women who are pregnant similar to the general population around 15 to 18 percent of pregnant women have severe disease the presentation of which is very similar to that in the general population with primarily respiratory failure there's been a couple of case series now of um, screening, particularly screening where people are admitted to obstetric wards. And again, there's a, a significant number of women who have asymptomatic infection with SARS-CoV-2, um, so are infected with the virus but show no clinical symptoms. And the proportion of women, again, seems to be fairly similar to that seen, seen in the non-pregnant population. 
the um, UK obstetric surveillance data, um, the most recent update shows that 427 pregnant women in the UK have been admitted to hospital with COVID-19 which is about five per thousand maternities and of these nine percent have required critical care so again this 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 is relatively reassuring in that it, it reflects the, the kind of proportions that we're seeing in the general population of those diagnosed with COVID-19 unfortunately five women have died which gives um, a case fatality rate of one one point two percent and again this is not dissimilar to that seen in the in the general population where women have been admitted with symptomatic COVID-19 it's tended to be um, in the later stages of pregnancy so most of those were admitted have been in the second measure in gestation is 34 weeks I'll come on to talk about what some of the reasons why that might be um, what, what is also apparent from the data that's coming out that the risk factors for severe disease appear to be similar between the pregnant and the non-pregnant population. So obesity appears to be a risk factor for more severe disease and worse outcomes both in mother and baby. And in addition, um, non-white ethnicities, so black and other minority ethnicities, carry an odds ratio of around um, four for admission to hospital in the pregnant population. And older mums are more at risk. Whilst um, early Early, um, sorry, outcomes with early with infection in early pregnancy are slightly more tricky to um, establish given the relatively short time scale of the pandemic thus far. There does appear to be an increased risk of spontaneous abortion with early infection, although the long term implications of that um, of the fetuses that survive the first trimester isn't known. And there's high rates of preterm birth, although from looking at the Chinese series where these are most marked. A lot of these are iatrogenic caesarean sections in order to rep improve respiratory function in the mothers. There are questions around the impact of hypercoagulability, which has been associated with many of the adverse outcomes in COVID-19 and what the impact of this is in the pregnant population. And I think a really key factor that we don't have information on at the moment is the long term neurodevelopmental impact on, on the children who are, of mothers who are infected during pregnancy. And this is a real concern. Obviously, there's almost no follow up data at the moment um, and certainly um, follow up data to, to gather the more subtle neurodevelopmental outcomes is not present and will not be present for 5, 10, 15 years. So I think there are good reasons why mothers should avoid infection. Um, but most of there are many unknowns and the data that we have thus far appears relatively reflective of the general population risk. So regarding the severity of coronavirus infections in pregnancy, um, there were concerns very early in the pandemic, given that um, in both SARS and MERS, the previous coronavirus, um, novel coronavirus infections, the case fatality rate was up to 25% in pregnancy. So pregnant women infected with these um, viruses had, had very, very poor outcomes. And this is thought to, the, um, thought to be due to the fact that um, the SARS and MERS predominantly have a Th1 driven immune response, whereas in pregnancy, actually, it's Th2 is the predominant, the preferential immune response during the pre um, during pregnancy. So, so women are more at risk from these viral infections. Similarly, in influenza, you can get a much more severe, overwhelming viral infection during pregnancy. However, we haven't seen a replication of this pattern in COVID-19, which is interesting in itself. Um, as I showed on the previous slide, the the case fatality rate is not dissimilar from the general population and there's increasing evidence of a significant proportion of asymptomatic disease or an asymptomatic infection during pregnancy and it's probably actually that the inflammatory response in COVID-19 is different from that seen in other viral infections it's not just a Th1 it's Th2 as well so there is some protection afforded during the pregnant stage um, during pregnancy. I think one thing that um is is very hard and we don't really have the numbers yet to understand the implications of this for COVID-19 is um the impact of the changing immunological clock during pregnancy it's very easy to think of people as either being pregnant or not pregnant so to think well during pregnancy you're immunosuppressed during, and that's very different from not pregnancy actually it is much more of a gradient um during the first and second trimesters there is increasing in immunosuppression and then actually the immune system changes during the third trimester to prepare the body for um, 
for childbirth and the postpartum period. So this really is a gradient rather than a single factor. And this, this may have implications for why we are seeing more admissions later in pregnancy. However, there are other um, non-immunological contributors to respiratory failure during pregnancy. So when a woman is pregnant, she has significantly increased metabolic and oxygen demands as she has to oxygenate both herself and the fetus. Pregnancy is associated with high, um, high incidence of anemia, and this can contribute to the um, metabolic and oxygen demands. In addition, the gravid uterus itself splints the diaphragm, it reduces lung volume, it reduces effective oxygen transfer, it prevents um, your your total lung, um, you filling your total lung capacity, also impact on any pre-existing cardiopulmonary strain. Um, there's also splaying of the thoracic rib cage, which again impacts on your tidal volume. So there are sort of um, biological, physiological, and um, mechanical reasons why respiratory failure is more common in pregnancy. And then we also have to consider the impact of hypoxia on the fetus. And really a lot of the um, preterm deliveries for respiratory compromise um, that are seen in COVID-19 from, from what I've established in the literature tend to, um, the respiratory failure tends to reverse relatively quickly following delivery. A lot of it seems to be biomechanical. You know, the, the, the gravid uterus, the fetus is impairing the respiratory function to the extent that it cannot cope with the dual strain of both COVID-19 and pregnancy. And once um, once the baby's been delivered, once the baby, the child is out and, and total lung volume is increased, actually mothers often make a, a relatively rapid recovery. Another aspect that's become apparent over the last few days is actually that there, there is significant placental pathology that um, has been seen in mums who, with, who have been infected with COVID-19. So these are pathological studies of placental tissue in the placenta derived from women with proven um, SARS-CoV-2 infection compared to um, controls from previous histological series. Um, and they've demonstrated an increased rate of features of uh, maternal vascular malperfusion, including atherosis, fibrinoid necrosis, hypertrophy of membrane arterioles. And these vascular... Um, these vascular malperfusions, which many of which appear in the, the COVID-19 scenario to be associated with hypercoagulability, have been associated in general with oligohydromnios, fetal growth restriction, preterm birth and stillbirth and other studies. So there is a mechanism by which COVID-19 um, can impact on pregnancy outcomes, particularly in the second and third trimesters as the, as the placenta grows. Um, there's an increase in the number of intervillous thrombi in placenta from women, women with who have been infected with SARS-CoV-2, which likely reflect the overall hypercoagulable state. However, it's not clear if this is, again, direct infection from the virus or whether this is actually a bystander effect. And, and my suspicion is it's probably this bystander hypercoagulable effect that appears to be driving a lot of the pathology that we see with this infection rather than direct infection. Although you do see ACE2 receptors um, expressed quite, quite highly on the placenta during pregnancy. So I thought probably the best way to think about some of the issues that arise during um, COVID-19 and pregnancy is to think about a few case scenarios and these are these are these are ones that are sli they're slightly contrived they're thought up to really try and illustrate some points points of relevance so the first one is a woman with ms who's been receiving ocrelizumab wants to start trying to conceive and she asks you what are the risks of covid19 in pregnancy and whether she should take any additional measures because of her prior dmt exposure so my thoughts about this when i sat down to try and think about it were there's some key aspects to consider. So when, when was her last ocrelizumab? When is it safe to start trying to conceive post ocrelizumab? What's her dis MS disease activity like? Has her disease been controlled on ocrelizumab? And how long is the period of immunosuppression post ocrelizumab? Um, I've got a bit more detail on this in the next slide, but 
one of the questions around ocrelizumab and pregnancy is the fact that you can probably separate out the period of biological exposure to the fetus so the half-life of the drug versus the period of immunosuppression following ocrelizumab and the two aren't the same um, and then the interaction between ocrelizumab and COVID-19 is it is it safe to be given ocrelizumab during the COVID-19 pandemic and then finally COVID and then a further, sorry, a further aspect to consider is COVID-19 and pregnancy. So as I said earlier, it's too early to know whether there are teratogenic signals from exposure or infection with COVID-19 during the first trimester. Um, but there are potential impacts to both the, the fetus and the mother of infection or exposure later in pregnancy. So in terms of the timing of the last dose of ocrelizumab, when is it safe to start trying to conceive post-ocrelizumab? So the SMPC in the, in, um, states times between six and 12 months however emerging safety studies um, have shown that it's probably safe to start trying to conceive much earlier and probably a couple of months after the last dose of ocrelizumab is a reasonable time to start trying to conceive for these women the, the fetal exposure to the drug because it takes three months for the placenta to even start secreting I, um, IgG across the placenta so it takes three months for the placenta to start developing you then have a period during which um, IgG does not pass the fetus so, so fetal exposure really is predominantly in the final trimester so even starting trying to conceive a couple of months after ocrelizumab exposure it's going to be at least six months post dosing before this fetus gets any dose of ocrelizumab and by that point there will be none left in the mother so probably the SNPCs are too um, too strict in their guidelines when you think about actually sort of biological real life and this is balanced up against the impact on MS disease activity as well. So with ocrelizumab, you potentially see an impact on disease activity that extends beyond the six months. Ideally, we like to aim for um, a, um, some form of disease control prior to trying to conceive, given that therapeutic options during pregnancy are quite limited, although this is based on individual circumstances. And then a further question, which I don't have all the answers to but how long is the period of immunosuppression post ocrelizumab my feeling is that this probably increases with more infusions i think we have a lot that we can learn from rituximab and actually probably infusions can be relatively safely spaced out after two years my rationale for saying that is the progressive drop in immunoglobulins that you see in in patients who remain on ocrelizumab or rituximab for some years and then finally, a further issue to consider with this patient is ocrelizumab or other anti-B cell therapies and COVID-19. And drawing from sort of international MS literature and also literature across other autoimmune diseases, there's still no clear signal of increased risk with anti-B cells, B cell therapies in the current COVID-19 um, outbreak. And probably early guidelines have been too strict about this. And this, I think this has been reflected as guidelines have somewhat softened. And then for this patient considerations around COVID-19 and pregnancy. So the maternal risk from respiratory disease, it's certainly not zero. And I think we can't falsely reassure our patients. And any maternal risk is likely to be exacerbated by the physical and physiological effects of pregnancy. However, we can be reassuring to a degree that there's no significant excess ITU admission or mortality in pregnancy in contrast to other um, pandemic or novel coronavirus infections. There's no signal for increased early pregnancy loss and there's no signal for teratogenicity, but it's really too early to be able to answer these questions with any um, degree of certainty. And around a woman's psychological help, it's imperative that, that women do not during pregnancy isolate themselves away and, and don't seek any medical advice and don't leave the house. Antenatal services have had a huge impact on maternal mortality and morbidity. And the, the impact of these can't be understated, both for the physical health of mother and baby, but also for, their, for the psychological health of the mother, both during and after, after pregnancy. And there is big concern now in the obstetric community around the impact of mothers not turning up to appointments, being too worried to leave the house, and the impact of this on maternal um, morbidity and potentially mortality. And one thing that is very striking is that the women who are at highest risk of adverse outcomes during pregnancy from COVID-19, so um, black and minority ethnic populations, those more vulnerable populations, populations living in poverty, 
are also those who've already been identified as being at highest risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes. So we have to think about how we make services accessible to these, these vulnerable women who may not, who may be too scared to access services in person, but really need to be supported and encouraged to do so. So moving on, the second case scenario that I thought it'd be helpful to think through is a woman with MS who informs you during a phone outpatient appointment that she's pregnant. She, um, as often happens, sort of says, beginning of point, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant. Um, and she asks you what the impact of her MS and COVID-19 are likely to be on her antenatal care. So again, the aspects to consider around this case, um, there's very regularly updated, so updated on a weekly basis, guidance from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists around antenatal care um, during the current pandemic. So the frequency of contact with the antenatal services is unlikely to have changed. However, the nature of these appointments may be different for at least some appointments. So phone appointments, video appointments, trying to support women with home monitoring, for example, home urine dipstick, home blood pressure monitoring where possible. However, um, anomaly scans are still happening, safety scans are still happening, where women need to be seen, they need to be seen, and this is still happening. There are huge efforts being put into making sure that this happens. Um, there are certainly is asymptomatic infection during pregnancy. It's around 13% in a case series from New York. Lower, there's a case series published, um, I think yesterday from Connecticut, um, where they show a lower rate, it's about 5% um, of women presenting to obstetric services had asymptomatic infection so it's, it certainly does happen um, and actually happens more commonly than symptomatic infection from the case series that are available there is also um, an encouragement of the use of one-stop visits or clinics to minimize um, exposure to women so combining antenatal visits with ms monitoring visits seems like a sensible thing to do it may require some thought on the part of both services um, but also encouraging these women to, to have opportunistic clinic visits that coincide with other outpatient appointments. You know, if you, if you need to come into the hospital on public transport, you only want to do it once rather than two or three times. So really actually trying to be set up services to be flexible so that these women can access all the care that they need with the minimum number of trips into the hospital. If women become symptomatically infected, then outpatient appointments may be delayed for a short period. However, obstetric services have been set up to make sure that, um, if a woman needs to be seen, she should be seen, and the appointments are not unduly or repeatedly delayed, and they should, um, I hate to say never, but the guidance is that they should never be delayed for more than three weeks. And then delivery options. So some options such as home birth are, have been restricted, and this is to ensure the safety of midwives. Um, hospital birth pools are no longer um, permitted to be used. And the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists suggests limiting um, induction of labour where it's not strictly indicated. However, there's no contraindication to vaginal delivery if the mother is well enough, and that includes during um, symptomatic COVID-19 if the mother is not um, significantly respiratory compromised. However, there are high rates of caesarean section seen in case series, but you have to bear in mind the countries that these case series come, up, come from. So most of the case series published to date come from either... Um, China or America where there are high rates of cesarean section anyway but indications for these include maternal respiratory distress exhaustion and failure to pro progress but notably in the Chinese series they, they see rates of cesarean section of up to 88 percent in the context of COVID-19 whereas the Italian case series um, puts it much more around 30 to 40 percent which is probably much more in keeping with the practice here. And then a final case from me. So a woman with MS who's six weeks postpartum contacts you um, saying she thinks she's having a relapse. She's currently breastfeeding. She does not wish to stop. And she asks you whether, she th whether you think that she should consider taking steroids given the current COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I think as we all know, as MSologists, there is no definite yes, no answer to the steroid question during breastfeeding. Um, but really some aspects to continue with the treatment of relapse in pandemic and the potential safety or lack of safety information around high dose methylprednisolone versus risks and benefits of breastfeeding and how to mitigate those risks. Um, one thing that, that came up after I'd written these slides actually, but um, has come up over the last 48 hours is the safety of um, steroids during pregnancy. So not in the breastfeeding population, but for relapses during pregnancy. 
um, and there appears to be a, a link between steroid use in pregnancy and um, long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes, so ADHD and similar disorders, um, start happening during childhood in um, from Finnish data. Um, so I think today I'm much more circumspect about the safety of steroids than maybe I was a few days ago. However, in the thinking about relapses um, in the postpartum period and, the, and in the context of the breastfeeding mother, so high dose corticosteroids can suppress um, the maternal immunoglobulin production, and this has implications both for the mother and also for passive immunity being passed um, being passed by a breast milk to the baby. It's been argued both ways. So there's been an argument that actually steroids can be used to reduce immunopathological um, immun immunopathological damage, and there's clinical trials ongoing to look at this. And there's also a suggestion that they may enhance viral replication, particularly um, where high dose steroids are given and then withdrawn. Early meta-analysis has certainly shown no benefit, although there is a huge amount of ascertainment bias for people with more severe disease being given steroids. However, I'd say I'd be slightly circumspect about steroids. I probably, um, if somebody had a severe relapse, would still be offering steroids, but would be advising strict isolation both during and after um, the high-dose steroid course for at least two weeks after receiving steroids where possible. And regarding breastfeeding, the potential benefits to the mother-baby diet are well documented, and I don't think um, I need to convince people here of the ben potential benefits of breastfeeding. Um, there's also increasing data suggesting an impact on relapse rate, particularly in those mothers with relatively mild MS. There's emerging evidence that you may be able to detect SARS-CoV-2 in breast milk. So there's um, a recent case report in The Lancet where they were able to detect viral um, viral RNA in the breast milk and potentially infectious virus particles on a number of samples, but that's in a single single mother. Um, there have been no other documented PCR positive breast milk samples that I could find in the literature. Um, so I suspect some women with symptomatic disease and high viral load may well be able to pass, pass the virus on, but from the, the, large, the relatively larger number of cases where they could not detect the virus it's unclear what proportion this is it's likely that the greater risk and this is in terms of mums who are either infected or asymptomatically infected is from close proximity to the nose mouth of the mother so um, the american center for disease control has very clear and, and very readable guidelines around ensuring the safety of breast milk including um, being rigorous about hand washing about using a mask to prevent any droplet infection to the baby particularly in those women who may be showing symptoms there is also benefits from breastfeeding around the transfer of maternal antibodies so even if the mother is infected if she's producing antibodies the baby will be protected against the virus in that way and we, we know this from um for example women who develop shingles during whilst breastfeeding that the risk of passing this on to the baby is actually relatively low because the baby gets um, maternal antibodies and then if somebody's relapsing postpartum there is always um, an argument around restarting disease modifying therapy however in this case must consider the safety in breast breastfeeding and considering whether MRI will help with decision making obviously access to imaging is is limited at the moment but if it's felt that MRI will help with that decision making then it shouldn't you know COVID-19 should not be a barrier to this and considering that not all disease modifying therapy is equally transferred via breast milk some are safe for breastfeeding others less safe so really this is my final slide um, and the main real take home message is the evidence is increasing on a daily basis and the evidence is changing on a daily basis and it's almost impossible to keep on top of it all especially for neurologists who are not pregnancy specialists and I think we do need to be clear with um, our patients and with the mums that we can do our best with the information available at the time but also be clear about where the uncertainties lie. I think the things that we can be sure about is that there is no signal for increased maternal mortality in COVID-19 and I think that is really important but that there is a likely impact on the fetus particularly in the later stages of pregnancy and I think the high rates of preterm birth cannot be ignored. Um, however these at least some of these may um, are due to maternal respiratory disease so stringent distancing particularly in um, the second half of the second and all of the third trimester um, 
is really important in order to minimize the the chance that mum developing COVID-19 but with a clear consideration to maternal the impact of that on maternal mental health antenatal and postnatal services are having to move online to a large degree and I think this this is really this is really hard for a lot of women and I think we need to we need to advocate for for women to make sure that that women are accessing help when they need it so I'm going to finish there and um, hand back over to Gavin. Thanks, Ruth. We haven't um, got any questions through on the Q&A slide, but I mean, you, you kind of dealt with the one question that was sent in before about the steroids. I mean, I've got a few case studies I can actually show. So, um, all right. So these are just to kind of illustrate the kind of issues that will arise. So we've got a patient here who's a 28 year old solicitor she had rapidly evolving severe MS and was treated with first line atomtuzumab in June 2018 and 2019. And she had uh, she originally presented with optic neuritis with poor recovery and then went on to have a spinal cord relapse after being treated with um, uh, uh, two courses of atomtuzumab. And she made a reasonable recovery and an MRI showed a high lesion load. So she's actually, at, uh, um, she's essentially a, um, Alentuzumab failure, failure. Um, for whatever reason that happened uh, with quite high disease activity. And she was actually referred for HACT and uh, she was passed through the committee and she was accepted for HACT, uh, but it was postponed due to COVID-19. Okay. She was also meant to have a, a variant stimulation in earth side harvesting and storage because of the cyclophosphamide exposure that goes with the HACT. And that's also halted due to COVID-19. So this is uh, what do you advise Ruth? so i think there's two as there's two issues here aren't there? that there's how how do you treat her ms for now and then then the family planning aspect um given that the ovarian stimulation and new site harvesting was um for her hsct um this slightly takes the pressure off in some ways one of the issues that we have is around um, when women are undergoing fertility treatment, the fertility doctors massively prefer them not to be on any treatment. So it can be very hard to have, have women on treatment um, dur during fertility treatment, although there is always a risk benefit discussion to be had, but it, th those discussions sometimes can be very tricky. Um, I want to have an honest discussion with her about her family planning situation. When she says planning start a family in the next two to three years, does she mean she's not sure she wants one yet, but she thinks she might want a baby in the next couple of years or she wants one, but it hasn't been quite the right time. And she's, she's postponing for that reason. Cause I think that does impact on your choice. She clearly needs to be on a DMT. I mean, she's failed on alemtuzumab. She's got lots of lesions and she's got, um, you know, several enhancing lesions. So I suppose well, I would, yeah, I mean, do you think it was appropriate for the neurologist to leave her off treatment waiting for HACT? Yeah, that's well, I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of what I was coming to. And I think this is where I would actually want to take her to, to an MDT to try and work out what is the best treatment for this woman and almost put the, the family planning thing aside for, for a while and say, you know, this woman really, she does not have well-controlled disease. She's failed alemtuzumab. She needs to get, you know, we need to get the disease under control. And also at the same time, need an honest discussion with her about whether she wants to start trying for a baby now or whether it's something that she wants, but not immediately. Um, I'm not sure what, what you would advise. I, I would, I mean, I would consider putting her on natalizumab. No, I would I actually, I, I was just going to say exactly that. Just put on natalizumab, get a disease under, disease under control. control. And um, then, uh, wait for what I mean. She may find that she does extremely well uh, on natalizumab and doesn't want to move. Yeah, I mean, one one thing that you haven't you haven't given is her her JCV. Um, so, you yeah. know, if if she's if she's JCV negative or even if she's JCV low titer, I think I would probably go for natalizumab because that would also make then the the pregnancy question somewhat easier because you don't you can continue you can certainly continue natalizumab up up until the point of conception and potentially during pregnancy um so so it feels like a very easy option um so the, so the other the other interesting thing is I'm, I'm wondering why and this is something i have never thought of before is is any reason why you kind of just put somebody on natalizumab and just go straight to hsct without a washout why would you need to wash out hsc uh, wash out uh, natalizumab before doing hsct probably not 
because at the end of the day it's about peripheral it's about peripheral immune ablation isn't it it is so they're not as it you know it is about peripheral immune ablation but you're it's giving somebody two immunosuppressive therapies um so i think it would depend on the duration that they'd had alemtuzumab uh had natalizumab for okay okay if Yes, yeah, so I, I think that's. So I think from the somebody solution, being on natalis for years and years with a high JCV titer, I would feel more anxious than if somebody had been on six, you know, uh, natalizumab for six months and only just converted, yes. sort of only just JCV sera converted. So I think that's a really um, individual yeah. risk there's benefit. No, there's no reason why you couldn't um, do a uh, herbicide harvesting uh, and storage while they're losing them, I would imagine. No, that would be fine. It's actually the, the concern around the, um, the IVF is actually around the implantation and continuing DMT whilst pregnant rather than the kind of oocyte harvesting or anything like that. Um, other so, than... So you could put this lady on uh, uh, losing hold on losing harvest her uh, over uh, eggs when she's ready for harvested. And then in, in, when the HSCT program reopens up, you can offer her the option of uh, HSCT. Yeah. Or if she's JC virus negative or she likes Nelluzumab, she may want to stay on it. That's yeah. Okay. I mean, that's it. And it sort of, it, give, it gives you that kind of luxury of time to, to, to help her to make the right decision for her. Okay, next case. Um, 34 year old female seamstress with relapsing MS. So she's uh, mid 30s. She started on Oculusumab in July 2019 and had a second course in January. So it's about right. Her initial presentation was right facial numbness. Uh, and in April, she presented with left optomuritis, good recovery. MRI has a reasonably, it's a moderate lesion load, no enhancing lesions. The CSF is positive. And she's starting, to, she was wanting to start a family in late 2020. So I assume, or early 2021, which is kind of the case you gave actually, you know? Yeah, so sort of not, not immediately. I mean, in this case, you know, at least you sort of have a time scale. I think often my discussions with patients, these kind of time scales come up because somebody's saying, well, I'm getting married in the summer and then I want to start trying for a baby very soon after I get married, for example. Um, so um, the general advice regarding pregnancy in the current climate, I think I've, I've covered. I think, I think COVID-19 is going to be around now for a long, long time. It's going to be an issue for a long, long time. And you can't delay, you can't put your whole life on hold forever. So I think, and I think it's really important actually to say that to people as well, that, that you can put your life on hold for weeks, but, but not for months and years because you, you have a fertility window and you know she's 34 she actually as much as it pains me to say this is you know if she wants to have um so you know have a reasonable chance of conceiving she probably needs to start trying to conceive sooner rather than later um would i redose with ocrelizumab or delay i would redose i think previously i've said i'd delay um if you'd asked me six weeks ago i probably would have delayed a bit i think I think now I'm feeling increasingly reassured about the data that's coming out um, and starting to strongly suspect that age, disability and other um, factors such as obesity are far more potent drivers of poor outcomes in COVID-19 infection than actually immunosuppression. So disability due to MS rather than immunosuppression secondary to MS, um, I suspect it's going to be a, a more powerful driver of poor outcomes. So I, I think I'm very much moving back towards towards redosing um, or dosing or initiating immunosuppressive treatment. Okay, there's a, there's a comment about adaptive dosing. So, um, I mean, that's obviously extending the interval, which, I do, which they're doing with rituximab in Sweden. I, I so, my my feeling is that you probably do this after two years. Um, it sort of feeds into your your fourth question as well. Um, on a personal level, I have, I have worries about continuing ocrelizumab at six monthly intervals for an infinite sort of undefined period of time. And probably I think two years is a good amount of time to sort of be not, not rigid, but relatively strict around two yearly doses and then to reevaluate, to look at B cell counts, to look at immunoglobulin levels and start thinking about adaptive dosing 
at that stage and certainly that's what I'm doing with rituximab in the NMO setting is saying we'll treat you six monthly for two years and then we'll start to extend your dose we'll look at your b-cell counts we'll look at your um, immunoglobulin levels and be be more adaptive at that stage because if you're starting somebody on an anti b cell at you know in their 30s when and how do you stop when where's your where's your where's your exit strategy because i do worry about the safety data that's coming around found hypogamma globulinemia with long-term use of these therapies and so she's obviously i think the fourth question is probably relating to vaccine readiness if there is a vaccine is about switching to an immune recoil well, that will obviously be cladribine or alemtuzumab um, I don't know if we're using alemtuzumab. No, I'd, I'd be very surprised if anybody's using alemtuzumab in the current environment. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I would, I'd want to know why she's considering that switch. I'd want to know how well con controlled she is on ocrelizumab. I would say if she's reasonably well controlled on ocrelizumab, then I, I would be tempted to to keep going with with that for the time being. Um, if she's got evidence of new disease activity on ocrelizumab, then then I'd want to rethink. Um, I think the issue around um, vaccine readiness is an is an interesting one, and I think that then you know starts to come into your questions around um, adaptive dosing and sort of duration between between infusions, and and being intelligent about how you time any vaccination. Yeah so, yeah, so my personal opinion would not to switch her uh, yeah. on Oculizumab. And if, if a vaccine does emerge, then she can just miss a dose or maybe even two doses and wait for B-cell reconstitution, yeah. which comes from the bone marrow. It's naive, so make a, that'll give her a much better chance of responding to a vaccine. I mean, this is it, but, you know, the, the vaccine's not really going to, there's not, she's not going to have a, there's not going to be a vaccine available until she's had at least 18 months of Oculizumab. Yeah. just just because of the sort of time that these things take to get through a pipeline so actually she's going to be a point at you know by the time a vaccine's available it will be a point at which we can think seriously about adaptive dosing about you know and that fits in then very well with um potentially with pregnancy planning because you say well normally we'd leave six months you start trying to conceive maybe two months after your infusion you know if we push your infusion out to eight months for example that gives you a six month window of trying to conceive so Sorry. it's 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 having those discussions and having them honestly with your patients just coming back to the vaccines what are the um do you think do you think these vaccines will be given to pregnant women or not no probably, probably not yeah. well I, I don't i don't think they will necessarily prioritize pregnant women unless there is um more of a signal around pregnancy or around the babies you know what what vaccines do pregnant women get now that they that they are otherwise ineligible for well it's flu and that's because the mortality and morbidity with flu in pregnancy is highly elevated and it's whooping cough because of the risk of whooping cough in the baby you know everything else actually there is no increased you know there is no increased requirement requirements the wrong word but no increased requirement for vaccination during pregnancy okay Okay, and then the final one um, is a 23-year-old female accountant uh, with rapidly evolving severe MS and has been on naluzumab for four years. She was JC negative and she's now converted to positive in October last year. And she was stuck on a sick uh, ERD since November. Uh, and she wants to fall pregnant in the next six months. She's hyper anxious about the potential risk of naluzumab to a baby. And she's also worried about rebound. Uh, what are you going to advise, Ruth? Well, I was going to try and advise that we didn't have time to get to this case because I found this one really, really <laughs> hard. <laughs> um, and it's hard. It's hard for many reasons. It's hard because of, you know, JC, JC positive, high index, um, being on natalizumab for a long time, wants to get pregnant, issues around rebound. Um, so I think I just have to go through, go through what, what the, the risks are with her i would be very anxious about rebound with her um i'd be very anxious and i think in the natalismab population um what's becoming clear from some, from some recent case series is there is even a benefit from continuing natalismab up to um up to conception or up to the you know just during the um just during the first trimester and that's actually better than having a washout period prior to pregnancy so maybe trying to find a happy medium with her where she has one dose during pregnancy 
and then plans to restart um, either either natalizumab or another agent immediately postpartum. So, you know, not, not being sort of rigid with her about you must have, you know, a two month washout or you must um, continue all the way through pregnancy because I don't think either of those are going to be particularly acceptable either to me clinically or to her and trying to find that happy medium around continuing to conception or continuing um, a last dose at say around 12 weeks gestation. Okay, and then the PML question is probably not answerable. So the PML question is interesting. So I did I tried to look tried to look this up actually before the webinar. Um, so vertical transmission rates in of JC virus are very very low. So that's the first thing. Um, so I did find some um, some serial epidemiological studies that show that actually vertical transmission of JC virus it's a thing, but it's 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 really very very low. Um, and this is held up by the fact that actually the seroprevalence is, is much lower than many viruses that um, are endemic and vertically transmitted. And then the second thing that occurred to me that I didn't quite have time to look up because um, we had to start was the fact that actually the when babies are born, they, they don't, they're unmyelinated. Your myelin develops during your first years of life. Okay. So then maybe they can't get PML. I don't think they can, but I, I didn't have time to look that up properly. But I'm not sure they can get PML because they don't have myelinated fibres. Yes, I actually, this came up quite a, f a few years ago when I did a search. I couldn't find any, uh, any uh, reports of neonatal PML. Well, I don't think, I don't think they've got myelin. Yeah, so, so that's, that's uh, but I, actually the virus doesn't only infect um, oligodendrocytes, it also infects astrocytes. So there is a potential that they could get. Um, but maybe but it's I, not PML, it's probably called something else. Yeah, so I think um, there is the astrocytic version that it, that's been described in the cerebellum. So I think that's probably, uh, you can re we could re reassure her that there hasn't yeah. been reports and it's unlikely to tr cross the placenta and cause any PML. And yeah. then the vaccine, um, I mean, this is a really anxious woman, so she wants everything done to her. Uh, she's also worried about SARS uh, and is considering waiting for vaccine before falling pregnant. I don't know if that's a good strategy because the vaccine may never arrive. Yeah, and it comes back to what I said about the last one. You can you can wait and wait and wait, and then, and this is the real issue with pregnancy. I think particularly is you can wait and wait and wait, and there's never the perfect time, and then the time's gone. You know, especially for women, you know, the fertile fertile period is over, and so you know, actually to to sort of say, well, yeah, you can, but but then there'll be there will be something else that another reason why you feel anxious about getting pregnant. So she should just forget about the vaccine. If it I think if she wants to get pregnant, she she should, um, you know, consider that and not consider the vaccine. The vaccine should not be a, a driver in that decision. And then switching to alemtuzumab, I think that will be very difficult in the current environment because we're not infusing alemtuzumab and uh, you, we don't really have the capacity, well, at least in our unit, to block a bed for five days. Uh, six yeah, days. and I think, I think in... in in these patients with high JCV index who've been on natalizumab for a long time, who are very risk averse, actually, um, alemtuzumab's not necessarily a good choice because there's lots of risks, potential risks around that that switch that would you'd have to discuss with her at least, and that would probably. Yeah. So there's a question. Sense. So there's a question there has come from who says maybe this third case would be a good case for cladribine. Actually, that's a reasonable. Um, it depends how quickly she wants to get pregnant, I guess. Um, so, because with cladribine, she'd have to have she'd have to wait um, up to six months. Yeah. So, I mean, to be honest with you, I um, I know you're not meant to tell patients this, but I um, we've had quite a few pregnancies in people falling pregnant after the first course. And don't wait the second second year. Uh, yeah. By accident or whatever or design. And yeah. I think uh, I think it's not a problem because there was data from the Australian experience when cladribine was first launched that you know one course is often sufficient to keep the disease in remission for quite a while. So cladribine would be an option, and it also de-risks the PML risk. You know? Yeah, and I think you know we also we also see that pattern of people getting pregnant after after one course, sort of after an incomplete and in inverted commas course of treatment with alemtuzumab. And again, you know, actually the pregnancy period while you're pregnant is a relatively low risk period for disease activity so i think it's you know it's partly thinking about when you interrupt your course but actually you're interrupting it with a relatively low risk period okay also what, what you've got to realize is that woman she's seroconverted so you, 
so uh, her test went positive in October and those very high seroconversions mean she's probably just been exposed to the virus and her previous test would have been about six months before if it was, um, so she's only been infected for less than, less than 12 months. So yeah. she's still in, she's still according to the algorithm in a, 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 a really, and she's on ERD now in a relatively low risk bracket. So you still got a bit of time to play with that losing you, know, you don't have to immediately change it or do anything like that. No. And I think I just, it, it does make you think that with down pregnancy and around, around risk in general, maybe, maybe it is the best because you can, you, you can push boundaries. You can play with boundaries to a certain degree about when, when you stop yeah. it. Okay, so we've run over time because it's meant to be a 40-minute uh, webinar. So thank you very much, Ruth, for being on. Okay. And All right, great. Thank you.